Well, Matthew, thanks for that excellent introduction. Really appreciate that. Uh, and I also just want to thank you all for your invitation. Uh, in particular, I got to thank my dear friend, Amanda Kennedy, who uh, has been giving me uh, pragmatic and spiritual advice uh, for, for years now. Uh, when I, we met in, 80, in 2007. And since that time, it's just been a pleasure to know you. And I also want to just say to uh, Scott, who is an administrator here, that it's a pleasure to be sir, and thanks uh, for the hospitality portion. Now, look, we're going to talk for about, we'll say we'll go for about an hour, a little bit less than that now. Uh, and my thought is that uh, I'll try to talk for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to have some dialogue. There's a lot of important things going on in the world now, and I think that we should talk about them. And I want you to know that there are no off-limit questions. Uh, and everyone who's here, I'm very pleased is here. It doesn't matter to me whether you're very liberal or very conservative or anything like that. There's nothing that we can't discuss uh, because I believe what James Baldwin said so many years ago, whatever can be faced, can be faced. And also, before we start tonight, feel that uh, there's so many, so many, so much death, so much loss in the world today. You know, just recently we had three students uh, who were lost their lives in North Carolina. Uh, at this point, I haven't read the press reports about what the motivation of the shooter was, but all lives are precious. And I uh, just hope we can keep the family things that we thought that we do. Victims of so many losses that go on across our country all the time. And uh, <coughs> so please keep, please uh, keep what you Try to remember these folks and keep your eyes on, on, on your hearts on them. The message I have for you is very simple. The message is very simple. It's, it is that you're not the future, you're the present right now. And as the people who are uh, in the present and who have the ability and the agency to impact the world we're in at this very moment, you have a certain responsibility. That responsibility is to act and to act with an attitude and an approach that is optimistic, that is uh, believing in the best of people, and that repeatedly reaches out to understand rather than retreats into a safe space so that you can reinforce what you already believe. The world has too many of those kind of people, way too many people who are already certain about the answers and don't need to engage anybody else to reflect on their <coughs> other people. Now, I'm not saying that you're gonna be persuaded by these other folks. I'm not saying you have a duty to change your own view. I am saying that you have a responsibility to expose yourself to other points of view so that perhaps you can learn something new. And after you get these new messages, after you shape your opinion about what the world looks like or is, then you will act upon it for the betterment of the world that we live in. I'm telling you now, when I was a kid, uh, young people were optimistic and idealistic, and they still are. And you run into, whenever I run into a young person who is cynical and who thinks that you're a sucker or a chump if you believe that things can be better, makes me a little sad. Whenever young people that I encounter think like it is somehow sophisticated to assume the worst and that nothing's gonna go right, it makes me a little sad. Because if the youth are not idealistic and the youth don't feel like the world can be a better place, heaven help the rest of us. Young people have always been the generator of energy and idealism and vitality, always. Let me give you just a short example. You know, who's watched the movie Selma? I'm glad you did, and I want to recommend all of you go check it out. And I'm gonna tell you now, it's funny, it's really funny watching Selma. Because every single day I get to go sit next to a guy who was like in Selma. Only now, he's 80 years old. His name's John Lewis. And John Lewis uh, was, was depicted in Selma. And at a time when they were calling him young love, he was 20, he was 21. And so I just want you guys to think that when you think about the civil rights movement, you think of some old timey thing. No, no, no. There were people who were there who 
who are still living, still kicking, and can come to this great campus and tell you what happened. And when you think about the challenges that they were facing, so many of them are still with us, are they not? But also many of them we have overcome too. The fact is, and this goes to this issue of cynicism, if you want to tell a tale that America is irredeemably, irretrievably racist, if you want to tell a tale that America is irretrievably religiously bigoted, if you want to say that the class divisions are so wide and the rich will always stomp on the poor, there's evidence in the record to stand on. But, but, what about the other side of the coin, too? What about the fact that we used to have segregation in our country and we don't? What about the fact that my mother, was inconceivable to her that there could be a black president, and there is. What about the fact that we have been able to say that there's opportunity for women that didn't exist in the past, and that today people don't have to like it, and they don't have to hate it, but you have every right to be who you are in so many other ways. These, this is progress, and I want to talk a little bit about these things, but my point is simply this, America is not, it's not a bad country, it's not a good country, it's our country, and it's our, it's our obligation to strive to make it better all the time. Yes, if you saw Selma, they had Sheriff Clark. He was part of the game, right? They also had Jimmy Lee Jackson, right? Who stood up for what was right. Yeah, they had the segregationists and they had the civil rights activists and they were all there. And the question is, who's going to prevail? If you look at it from this point back, you have to conclude that the civil rights activists won that. Did they win it completely and utterly? Did they stamp out people in the world? No. But they won that round, and we're all better off for it. There are rounds going on now that I want you to think about. There are rounds going on now, things, fights that you need to be involved in, fights that I think you need to engage in, and I recommend that, that you, you participate fully in. I want to just mention a few of them. I think one of the most serious problems facing our country today is this problem of income inequality. And when I say that, what I mean is that since about 2008, our country has created wealth. And yet, 93% of the wealth created in our country, 90% of the gains, have gone to the top 1%. Many of you carrying on student loans, many of you coming from families struggling to be here. If you're rich, it doesn't really matter how much Georgetown costs. You got the dough. If you're poor, well, you know, you might be able to get some scholarships, and that's good. But if your parents are police officers or teachers or nurses, hardworking folks, small business people, they are making a major sacrifice for you to sit in this room right in this room right now. And I hope you appreciate it. But it doesn't even have to be that way, because you know, do you know in Germany they went to free tuition? You know you you're smiling, you must have heard that. All right, well see. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so but I'm, okay, so I got a witness. I'm telling the truth, right? Well, not just Germany. What about Denmark, right? And others. You know, the fact that education is so expensive in the United States, even at public universities, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. This is a political decision we have made. My generation had a meeting, and we said. Okay, what do y'all want to do? You want to help these kids get a college education or you want to get a tax cut? And we all collectively said, give us the money. That's kind of what happened. Okay, the, the meeting didn't actually happen. <laughs> but it's kind of like, that's what happened, if you know what I mean. This is a political decision that we are making. I am telling you now, one of the reasons that we have had very, in my opinion, anemic economic growth is there are not enough rich people to spend money to fuel this demand-driven economy. 70% of GDP is, is, is consumer demand, stuff we buy. But ordinary working class people don't have been getting any raises, so they don't have the money, and they're consuming based on debt. In 2008, we had a 2%, excuse me, a negative 2% savings rate. What does that mean? That means that if you get paid every week, at the end of the week, you were having to get off the credit cards. 
Now this is true whether you are Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, or none of the above. This is a reality for everybody. And if you got it like that, if you're, you know, child of a hedge fund manager and you just banged it up, no problem. But if you're anybody else, it's a problem. Because our country, if you're going to think of one word that symbolizes America at its best, what would that word be? This is the time for audience participation. One word, not two, not five, one word capturing America at its best. What do you got? Good word. Come on, help me out. Yep, justice. Justice, all right, good. Yep. Equality. All right, all right. Progress. Let me add on possibility. This is supposed to be the place, supposed to be the place when if you are a African-American woman scrubbing toilets in a local hospital, making $9 an hour, you can believe that your son's gonna be a doctor. That's where, this is what this place is supposed to be. You can be a white male factory worker in Alabama and say, you know what? I believe I'm gonna get enough money to start my own business and follow my dream. If you immigrated here from Pakistan or India or, us, I don't know, name a place, you come here thinking that maybe you can't, maybe it's not possible in the country you came from, but if you land on these shores, man, your limitations are only the limitations of your ability to imagine and work hard. And yet the fact of the matter is, America does not hold the title of intergenerational economic mobility in this world. In fact, every year that goes by, mobility becomes more a place in somewhere in Western Europe than it does here. And it used to be the other way around. It used to be that if you're some, you know, I don't know, young German uh, carpenter, then you probably, your dad was a carpenter. It used to be that if you were a, a young a factory worker, your parent was a factory worker in Japan or anywhere. But now, the biggest indicator of your success in America, this country of possibility, equality, and justice, is getting to be what your parents did. That's bad. That's bad. We cannot allow this to go forward. Not only does it diminish our dreams of educational achievement, diminish our dreams of social mobility, it actually harms our democracy. And you're like, whoa, 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 well, so you were just talking economics, now you're talking democracy. Let me tell you how. Because what do you think these people making all this money do with it? You can only ski behind so many ski boats. You can only sail behind so many boats. You can only visit so many houses after you've done bought them, all five or six of them. I remember John McCain said he didn't know how many houses he owned. That's a good problem for you, I guess. <laughs> if you can get that kind of work. My point is, when you get, when people get at a certain income level, they use the economic privilege that they've been able to acquire to buy political influence. How do they do that? Well, they pay lobbyists to go to Congress and tell people like me, uh, hey man, I want you to, we, if, if you give us this tax break, we're going to be able to uh, really do a lot of jobs. Everything's job, right? They, they come and they, and when I'm running for office, and I got, and they, they say, well, yeah, you know, we might come here fundraising, but we want to talk about this little um, tax preference, you know. And, you know, you think we can discuss it? Sure. They don't ever say, we'll do it, we'll give you the money if you vote our way. They never say that. People know better than to say that. They just say, you know, we kind of see the world our way, then maybe we'll talk, and who knows, maybe we'll do your little fundraising. You know what I mean? So, but not that so. People like me spend three, six, ten hours a week on the phone doing call time. What is call time? 
I go into a little cubby hole. Okay, this is my glamorous progression of life. <laughs> I go into a little cubby hole and I sit in a chair and I crank sheets of paper and say, would you support my election campaign? And I'm telling you straight up, I'm one of those people from a very safe Democratic district and they tell me, Keith, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee tells me they want me to come up with $300,000 every two years. Oh, and that's just the hard money. There's a whole other soft money thing that only come up with half a million dollars. And that's just one guy. Now, look, the point is, our economic system has created a circumstance where is Keith Ellison, and I'm going to tell you, I bucked the trends, and I'm going to tell you that in a minute, but I'm just giving you the facts so you know the truth. Is a guy like Keith Ellison, if he's just going to go along to get along, is he going to talk to the $50 donor? Or is he going to talk to the max out donor? Because one donor can give me $2,600, and I run it in a primary and a general, so now that's about $5,200, and the spouse can give, so now that's upwards of 10 grand. So if I'm going to spend six hours on the phone, am I going to talk to somebody that's going to give me 50 bucks or talk to somebody that's going to give me $10,000? Now, who has $10,000? Let me assure you, if I were a political donor, I'd be a $50 donor. I have four kids, and one of them's still in college. For sure, I'm not going to give them nobody $10,000. But who can? You understand my point? Our economic system is being corrupted, people. <laughs> you think I'm going to come here and lie to you? Now, you might think, Oh, Congress is bought, forget it, no hope. That would be the wrong message. Remember all the stuff I said about um, hope, optimism, stuff like that? It's still all true. I'm just telling you this is a problem you and your generation have got to help us solve. One way we can solve it is we can say that we need to publicly finance political campaigns. We can say, okay, Ellison, First of all, we're going to limit donations to $100. You know what? That'd be awesome to me. I hate it all the time. Right? And guess what? I don't know any members of Congress who like it. I came to Congress so I can serve people and try to work out serious problems our country's facing. Not to get on the phone and sweat people over money. And if I get, the, if I get a certain number of $100 donations, I get a match. Do that. And now, I'm spending more time working out problems on behalf of the American people than I am fundraising. This is doable and within our power to do. Now you're saying, Keith, why would they ever let us do that? They won't let us do that. We're going to make them do that. You get my point? You think they wanted to pass the Voting Rights Act? You think they wanted to pass the Civil Rights Act? You think they wanted women to vote? No! They were made to. It was the least bad alternative. And a lot of people got hurt doing these things. You don't, even, you don't have to risk any blood. You just got to be determined and unreasonable and uncompromising and fight for it. Let me also tell you this. This economic division in our country, which has grown the, the problem is not between the people making, it's not between the poor and the middle class. They're both stagnant. It's the very wealthy and everybody else. And, but here's the thing about the very wealthy. I, I'm the co-chair of a group called the Progressive, not called the Progressive Caucus. You know who one of our great allies is? A group called the Patriotic Millionaires. These people got big money, but they don't like the division growing in our country. They don't mind paying taxes. They don't. I mean, they don't want to pay more than they have to, but they do understand that any, it costs. If you want a good society, the price of civilization is taxation. And as long as it's fair, equitable, and everybody has to do their bit, they don't mind. Their problem is two-thirds of American corporations don't pay any taxes. Well, what about the one-third that do? They say, wait a minute, why am I paying everything? And they're not paying nothing. Why is, you know, Joe's Chicken Shack paying, but GE, it doesn't pay? You get my point? They're concerned about the inequitable. So don't believe that just because people have money that they're not on our side. There are people on our side who believe this. So publicly financed campaigns are one way. Here's another way. Corporations. 
cannot give money to political campaigns. And sometimes they can give campaigns money to a campaign that can then turn around and spend money and doesn't even have to identify who gave them the money. How's that? How do you like them apples? Right? Well, what if you said in order for a corporation to give money, because the Supreme Court said they could, the corporate person is not the CEO. The corporate person is the collective will of the shareholders. So if you want to have the corporation spend money, well, you got to have a resolution authorizing the expenditure of money for this purpose. How many shareholders are going to say, oh, no, 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 I don't want to dividends. I would run ads saying that that guy is a jerk. I think that they're not going to get a whole lot of energy from it. I think the, the money will slow down. One thing that me and a guy named Mark um, Hocan are working on is, uh, is a bill that says that if you're a corporation and you have a, a, set, a set of any kind of felony conviction, then you may not donate to political candidates. Now, you know, before Citizens United, corporations couldn't donate to political candidates. Now, after Citizens United, you know, the Supreme Court says corporations are people who have First Amendment rights and can express themselves. A ridiculous notion. <laughs> um, now, they do donate. The corporations can donate. Well, if you, as an individual person, had a bad luck, either through your stupidity or dishonesty or whatever, don't get a felony or bad or, or just innocent, but you end up with a felony conviction, there are many states in the where you couldn't vote. Or at least you couldn't vote until you're on probation or parole. But if you're a felony corporation, you can still give money and participate in the political process. I don't know, maybe not. And you think you keep down there? Are there corporations that have felonies? Oh dear. <laughs> oh yes, there are. Think of BP. BP, who's ever heard of BP? British Petroleum? You know, the people who brought us the oil spill in the Gulf a few years ago? They got six felony conditions. Why should they be able to enforce the first class? They, you know, I'm like, well, they can still lie, but they just can't donate to candidates. Who thinks that's a reasonable idea? Well, see. So my point is, there are things that we can do. Now, there's also, there's also uh, something else we can do that I think would make a big difference, and that is change the Constitution to say that you have an explicit right to vote. Oh, you didn't know you didn't have an explicit right to vote in the Constitution? You don't. The Constitution says in the 15th Amendment, well, first of all, in the 13th Amendment, it says that you will not be stopped from voting. Or no, you you uh, you will not be stopped. Uh, you, 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 know, okay. you will not be. The, nobody can be can have their liberty deprived of their terms of voluntary servitude unless for purposes of criminal, you know, conviction or punishment. Then the 15th Amendment says you can't be stopped from voting based on you know, previous condition of servitude or race. So they can't stop you from voting for these reasons. They don't say you can vote or you have an affirmative right to it. They just say they can't stop you for these reasons race. That's the 15th Amendment. That's the one, one that gave black men the right to vote. Then we move on up to 1920 and the 19th Amendment. Then we say, okay, all adults, men and women, you can't stop a person from voting because of because of their gender or sex. Still stated the right stated in the negative. Then we get to the 24th Amendment, which said you cannot impose a poll tax. Then we get to the one that says that you cannot uh, stop somebody from voting uh, uh, that, you know, you can vote after you're 18. Because you shouldn't have to go to vote after you're shot at, and you can't even vote. But we do not have an explicit right to vote. If you had an explicit right to vote, what would happen, and the law students who might be here will tell you, that whenever there's a, a law that in any way impairs, impinges, or infringes on the right to vote, it will be evaluated based on any other constitutional right. And that's something called strict scrutiny, which means that it has to be very narrowly tailored to meet a compelling state interest. And that's hard to pass a law that is narrowly tailored to meet a compelling state interest. Or a compelling state interest. So you say, for example, you take these rights, these bills, and say we have to, uh, everybody has to have a government issued identification card to vote, these photo ID. You know. And in Texas, you can 
use your gun ID to vote, but you can't use your student ID. <laughs> I'm trying to let you know who they want to vote, right? <laughs> and, so, and so the thing is, in that case, you know, they would say, well, we're going for this law to meet constitutional scrutiny. It, it has to be some kind of a compelling state interest. What's the compelling state interest for this law? Well, a lot of people said voter fraud. Okay, so show me a case. And whenever you challenge these people, they can never come up with it. There, are no, there is no cost of voting going on. I'm not saying they never went on, but I'm saying that the statistical likelihood of happening is so infinitesimal that it's zero. You follow me? So you wouldn't, so if we had a constitutional right to vote explicitly identified, all of these laws would be scrutinized and would be rejected. And I'm telling you, it would help a lot of folks because people say, oh, there's 50 different ways to vote. There ain't 50, I wish there were 50, just 50. There's about 8,000. These things vary from county to county. Butterfly ballots in one. Hook out the little thing in another. Fill in the oval in another. All these counties vary. One state, you can vote. You, you, they never take your right to vote if you get in trouble with the law. Another state, they take your vote right to vote away while you're incarcerated. Other states, you, they take your right to vote away after you get out of incarceration and you don't get restored until you get off probation. Other, but it's automatic. Other states, it's not automatic. You have to apply. Other states, you can't get it back. But if you had a constitutional right to vote, then we might be able to fix all of this crazy stuff. So I'm telling you that cynicism never fixed any problem. The problems that you and I face today are hard ones. But I believe in your generation to help us all. I believe in your generation to help us all. Let's just talk about this issue of climate change for a moment. Somebody said to me the other day, keep the most serious. I, I, I was talking about how income inequality and our elect and the, and, the, and the implications for our democracy is the most serious problem facing America. They said, no, 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 Keith. The planet is in jeopardy. The planet is in jeopardy. That is the most serious problem. I said, I beg to differ because until we fix Congress, we can't even pass any laws to address carbon. So again, back to this issue of democracy, which I want you to think about how to fix. And for sure, you can do it. John Lewis, who I get to sit next to every day. You look at him back in that movie, Selma, he has full head of hair. Now he has absolutely none. <laughs> He's really thin. And Really lean, probably was walking around about 130 pounds. He spread out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you, the fire burning in that man's chest has not extinguished one bit. And I want you guys who are passionate, who have an intense love for this country and want to see it rise to its full height. I, don't believe people when they tell you, oh, yes, son, uh, once you have to start paying mortgages and have kids of your own, you'll be, uh, you'll uh, come right along, dim your hopes, it'll squeeze all the life out of you, all the dreams will go away, and all you're going to worry about is a picket fence and getting into a country club. Not true. Those are choices. You don't have, it doesn't have to be that way. And these are decisions that people make. I am telling you. And some of the most progressive people I know, some of the, some of the most civil rights oriented people I know, are people in their 70s. But there are also people who are in their teens. And I had one of the great privileges this last weekend to meet with a young woman named Alicia Garza. Anybody know her this young know, lady before? You probably don't know her, but I'm going to tell you, I bet you you hear her pretty soon. She's one of the leaders in this Hands Up, Don't Shoot movement, also known as the Black Lives Matter movement. She actually coined the term Black Lives Matter. After, uh, after the Trayvon Martin thing. And uh, she was talking about her movement and how you know, the interaction between communities all over this country has been such that uh, all of the, you know, it's not just Eric, it's not just Eric Gardner in New York, it's not just Mike Brown and Ferguson, it's not just these other suspected thing all over the country. And it was really uh, great to hear her talk about her passion. And she talked about the need for grand jury reform. And we talked about the need for um, for uh, so many other changes like body cams and stuff like that. 
And I asked her, I asked her, I said, you know what, Ferguson, let's just talk Ferguson for a minute. Do you know 10 years ago what the unemployment rate was? She said, I don't know. I said, well, now it's about 13%. 10 years ago, it's about 7 and a half. It's still an outrage, but much lower than that. You know what the rate of poverty was 10 years ago? Lower than it is now. Do you know what the rate of, of income, the, the average wage, the non-farm wage level, it is stagnated and declining? I said, do you know how many factories around St. Louis have just picked up and left? Well, quite a few. Anybody from Missouri? So, you know I'm right. Absolutely. Yeah. So my point is, the reality is, I told her, I said, you know, you got to get, I want you to think about issues of police brutality, police accountability, and criminal justice, but I also want you to think about economics, too. Just think about it this way. If you got Ferguson, a community where the poverty is up, wages are down, and unemployment is up, what are you going to have on the corners? She said, well, people are going to be hanging on the corners because they're not working. So of course that's right. Now, the nice people, you know, the people who have jobs and go to work every day and who do not think big picture and who don't know nothing about globalization, deindustrialization, what do you think they want the police to do about the guys hanging on the corner? Get them off the corner. I said, do you think it's a black or white matter? No, I don't. Black people want people off the corner, particularly if they think they're selling dope, off the corner too. Am I wrong? Any African American challenge me on this point. You know I'm right. Your mother, my mother, your dad, my dad, like, I'm sick of them guys out there. Now the truth is, maybe Eric, Mike Brown wasn't doing anything wrong, but you send the police to get the guys off the corner, the police didn't make any distinctions between anybody. They treat everybody the same. Somebody said, well, you know, it's, you don't understand the millennials. I said, wait a minute, Eric Garner is not a millennial. Eric Garner is probably a baby boomer or something close to it. My point is, you don't sell Lucy cigarettes on the street if you have a livable wage job. You understand my point? Maybe Darren Wilson, who shot my brother, is a jerk. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's a racist. Maybe he's not. I don't know. But I can tell you that in a community that has been deindustrialized like Ferguson and has the collateral damage of that economic uh, uh, abandonment like Ferguson, Darren Wilson and Mike Brown were on a collision course. Now maybe, maybe Darren Wilson could have been a cooler guy and say, hey, Mike, you know you're not supposed to be out here. And by the way, I heard there's a story about you doing something at the grocery store. He, maybe he could have been a cool cop and just kind of handle it in a nice diplomatic way. Or maybe he's going to be a tough guy and got his testosterone up and he's going to prove the point and you end up with a combustible mix. But the point is, the, the, what brought them into collision was the economic abandonment of that city. It was the fact that we have been bleeding jobs through, I believe, unfair trade agreements. It has been because we have not been invested in industrial in, 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 in our nation's infrastructure. It is because we have allowed collective bargaining to weaken. And I'm going to tell you this about collective bargaining, folks. <laughs> when workers don't have any voice on the job, their wages stagnate. I'm sorry. Look at the charts. That's what happens. So what I'm telling you is that cynicism never solved any social problem, or or it never made anybody more equal. It never passed a bill. It never organized a rally. We need you to be optimistic. We need you to believe that this country is yet to be the best it can be. We need you. Be active, we need you to be thinking, we need you to be writing, we need you to be writing a song, a rap, a paper, something. We need you to be organizing, and we need you to keep that fire burning in your in yourself. Now I think I should probably take a mention about Islamophobia. When I was elected to Congress in 2006, I was a member of the Minnesota State Legislature for two terms, that's four years. While there, I had my local imam at the mosque that I go to on every Friday 
come do the opening prayer. During Ramadan, somebody said, hey, let's catch some lunch. I'm like, ah, you know, <laughs> You know what I mean? And it was, a, you know, everybody knew I was a Muslim, nobody cared. It was like a total non-fan in Minnesota State Legislature. And do you know what? I don't know if I was ever the first Muslim in the Minnesota State Legislature. Nobody asked. <laughs> nobody, you're the first one. Nobody asked. But when I, was, well, when I got the, the nomination of my party, after I won the endorsement of the Democratic, the DFL, I, I walked out to a bank of microphones. Everybody thought the endorsement convention was going to go all night. It ended after three ballots. I walk out there, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We thought we'd be there at 11 o'clock at night. And I think they're going to ask me, how did you win so quickly? Are you surprised? What is your plan? Blah, 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 blah. All these questions they ask politicians all the time. And I thought, this is the question, first question out of the person's mouth. Not sure. <laughs> okay. If you win, will you be the first one in Congress? And I said, I thought, what I thought is, I doubt it. But then I said, I don't know. And then it was like <clears throat> Alice walking through the looking glass, man. Every time I opened my mouth, it was about my religion. Does your wife cover? Does she not? She had to walk behind you. No, that's another thing. <laughs> you know? I mean, there was all this. There was all this stuff. At some point, uh, somebody asked me, uh, "If you win, will you swear in on the Quran?" And this was way before election day. I said, "Man, I'm not thinking about swearing in on anything. I'm about winning some elections, knocking some doors, talking some voters, making some calls." You know, I'm not. Just a, but then the guy who's clever, you know, he says to me. Well, can you imagine when can you just feel it? <laughs> and I go, absolutely, I can imagine it. I've imagined it several times. <laughs> and he said, well, in your imagination, and it's where you get to your hand. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> now, this conversation happened on late night, cable access, Somali language, public access television. <laughs> Now who's watching? Not even the Somalis was watching. Nobody. <laughs> but the right wing was watching. Because <laughs> they saw the show, and boy, they went into a tizzy. They freaked completely out. In fact, one guy named Dennis Prager, y'all ever heard of him? He's a radio talk show host, you know, shock shock. He says, Keith Ellison is more dangerous to the Republic than Osama bin Laden. <laughs> I didn't Osama bin Laden. I'm like, uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> so, there's all this fury. All these people are writing to my colleagues, my future colleagues in Congress, and telling them, you know, don't let Ellison swear in the Quran. They don't, you know. What I then learned, to my surprise, is that at the swearing in, there's no books. You just walk on the, you go down into the, to the, to the well, or you go into the, to the, uh, to the floor, and the speaker says, "Do you swear to protect and defend the United States against all enemies for in, in domestic?" And we all say, "I do." There's no book, but after you can go to a little room, bring all your relatives in, and then they got cameras, and then there's like a photo op, right? <laughs> So at the photo ops where it's swearing in, you know, that's where this the big day is gonna come from. So as we're getting all this mail, a lot of hate mail, more hate mail than I ever got before, and I got some hate mail before, but now I'm like getting a lot of hate. At one point, between my election and before my swearing in took place, I was getting more hate mail than any other kind. And boy, you can imagine. Plenty of N-word stuff, plenty of rights in terms about Muslims. Oh, like, it was horrible. You know, it was not good to tell them, or, or, uh, or a family audience. You know, I'm afraid to say it even into a college audience. I mean, some of you guys might not be 21 yet. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, you know, we, we, but one, among all that mail, we got one letter that is special. And it said, you should swear it up on the uh, Quran of Thomas Jefferson. And I'm like, 
that's a good idea. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't always think of good ideas, but I know when I see one. <laughs> and so we called the Library of Congress, and boy, you know, you know these people, you know, they're like librarians. They were so excited. This must have been the best thing ever happened. I'm like, somebody cares about our book. We got a book, so they actually want to get our book the news. This is awesome. so, so they're excited, so they, they work it out. So then the big day comes, right? And, uh, so we're, we've already been really sworn in, now we're going to do a new family thing. And you know, if you ever go, if you ever run it for Congress and you win, you get a whole bunch of relatives you ain't seen in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're there, and uh, they bring out the books. That's like the thing. So they've been in a, a, a temperature controlled room, uh, carefully taken care of, and then the, the guy who's the book and like he's told these books for his dear life. He shows me where it says TJ and strategic places in the book. Thomas Jefferson, right? I see it's a two volume book. It's all English. It does not like, you know, most Qurans you open have an Arabic, English, or Arabic, whatever language, or just Arabic. This one is just all English. But I know the Quran well enough to tell if it's a decent translation. So I flip through for some. Some surahs that I know very well. I'm not a Hafiz of Quran, which means I don't know the Quran from the beginning to the end. I know enough of it to know, though. And I thought that I would have that. So, you know, there's this wall, a literally a wall of, of reporters. They are from Malaysia, Bangladesh, Colombia, all over the world. And here they are to take a picture of the first Muslim guy. So we, we all go up there, and, you know, after the all the lights, you know, looking at the guy all over the room. Uh, it's kind of over. And the haters just stopped hating. Because I guess they didn't want to take issue with my all American Quran, right? Because it's owned by Thomas Jefferson. So I say that to say this. You know, our country, uh, our country is, 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 as I said, is, 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 is actually a tug of war between our best impulses and our worst. And the people, and, 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 but those two people pulling are not the only people in the game. Those people are still on the side. And then they get on the side of where they get to win sometimes. The fact is, it is a good thing to have this nation that says it's about liberty and justice for. Y'all don't know it? <laughs> Liberty and justice for oh. Thank you very much. Um, it is a good thing for us to have all of the American people reflected in the deliberative body of their government. There shouldn't be seats reserved for anybody, in my opinion, for anybody who convinces their seventh the majority of their the electorate to elect them out of them. I'm very proud that the United States Constitution says there's no one to test the holding off. Think about that. As bad as America was on Native Americans, Blacks, and women, it actually was not that bad on religion. That's a, that's a good thing. But there are plenty of fights about religion now. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to oversell it. Kind of sell it. At the end of the day, though, our nation uh, has to make room for everybody, including the Muslim community. And the fact of the matter is, the Muslim community is, is impacted by everything else, including climate change and income inequality, just like everybody else. And there's nothing unique or different about Muslims other than they elect to pray on a different day in a different way. Actually, most of the prophets that the Christians and the Jews recognize, so do the Muslims, which is actually interesting when you think about it, including Jesus. So the bottom line is that, you know, we're in this battle about who's in and who's out yet once again. We've been through this battle many times before. You know, we've been through this battle many times before. But I believe in the best interest, uh, in the better nature of our country. I believe that the, believe the fear will subside, the nobility and good faith will prevail. It's going to be a bumpy road along the way. And I'm telling you, it is the responsibility of every, all of us to help this, this, this journey. People who are not Muslim, people of other faiths, 
the guy said, well, you know what, at one time in this country really was hating on Catholics for real ugly. I come from the city of Detroit, Michigan originally. There was a guy named Father Cogman, and he would get up on the radio and talk about the Jews. He would take it over. And he was, he was like a working class ally too. So he was trying to whip up populist hatred against Jewish people. This was a this was in uh, in the Detroit, Michigan area. Of course, Mormons, you know, they you know, you saw when Romney was out there, they were hating, they were hating on the Mormons, right? They had all they had they got put out of the whole states. I'm telling you, this thing is going to be fine. But it's going to take all of us to speak up and do the right thing. It's also it's also responsible to the Muslim community because I, I earnestly believe that you cannot go into the mosque Lock the doors, pray in there, and then don't invite anybody in, don't go out. Gotta be, you know. I say to these Muslim communities raising all this money to build a new mosque. I'm like, look, nobody's in there on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it's packed, Saturday, you got some classes, Sunday, you got some classes, they go back to the empty all week long. Look, get the people in here. Show them that it's just a prayer room. They can come too if they want to. And I am proud that there's a lot of Muslim and, 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 and Christian and Jewish and Hindu and dialogue that's taking place. And I'll wrap up with this story. Um, one example is in my community, you know, the imam at the mosque I go to, uh, and the rabbi of the largest synagogue in Minneapolis are part of this thing called the Downtown Council. And they get together and you know, talk like what clergy people talk about. I don't know what they talk about. I'm not a clergy person at all, and, uh, but I trust that they're not up to no good or anything. And so, and so they're, they're in there doing their church stuff or religious things that they do. And they came up with this idea. They said, look, you know, a few years ago, Yom Kippur and Ramadan <coughs> coincided on the calendar. And since both the Jews and the Muslims were breaking fast together, they agreed that they would get the congregations together and break fast together. And when the Christians found out the Muslims and the Jews were getting together, they, they were like, hey, we got to see this. <laughs> <laughs> so they showed up too. And while we had about 70 some people say they were coming, about 125 people showed up in our little box. And what happened is first, sundown came and us Muslims, we got out and we did our thing called Magra prayer. And I don't think most Jews or Christians ever saw that before. And they see us all doing our stand up, bend over, bend down, prostrations all together. And they're like, did y'all rehearse this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do it all the time. <laughs> <I'm not here. laughs> so so, so they, we do our thing. And then the Imam kind of explained a little bit about the, the ritual of what we call Salat or prayer. And then we gave up the floor to the Jews, and the Jews went out there, and the, you know, and the, and the rabbi talked about, uh, you know, their ritual, which was new to us. As we were walking downstairs, we had this big, there's this big box, and it says Sadaka on it. It was this old Jewish lady that says Sadaka. I said we call it Sadaka, but it's the same thing as giving money and charity. Literally the same word. So we go downstairs, and as I said, and too many people showed up. So the imam and the rabbi said, look, we don't have a, if more people came, we have a good problem, more people showed up than we planned for. So me and the rabbi are gonna sit on the carpet right here, we're gonna eat, anybody who wants to join us can. And people started, you know, mixing in and getting to know each other and we found out that you know we had so much more in common than uh, the world would believe that we did. And it was a great evening. And from that night on, I've always thought to myself that this is we should we should break bread right together, we should share meals together, we should feed the poor together, we should visit the elderly together, we should make the world a better place together. We don't even need to sit around and talk about religious doctrine. Who cares? Nobody's trying to persuade anybody or make anybody different. Because I believe God converts, not you. So we had a wonderful evening ever since that time. You know, I've been absolutely committed to active engagement around interfaith dialogue, not just, you know, let it be. And I think it's incumbent upon Muslims to 
call out anti-Semitism and call out anti-Christian hate. The churches burned in various parts of the world. We should condemn this. This is not the sooner. You all, you must know what I'm saying. It's true. You know, there was a particular uh, hadith where there was a funeral procession going by and the deceased person was Jewish. Prophet Muhammad stands up in honor of the person. The other people who were with him, the Sahaba, they're like, why are you standing up? This guy's not in our group. He says, hey, we honor the dead. All. You understand? There's that and there's many, many other. There's also in the Sinai Peninsula, there's, there's, a, there's a doc, there's a letter that Prophet Muhammad wrote to the monks of St. Catherine in a monastery. When he actually wrote them a letter and said that none of my people will harm your church. In fact, if it breaks down, we'll help you fix it. If anybody attacks you, we will protect you. This is a legitimate, authentic document. And, you, and all you guys who are of other faiths, you know if I was wrong, the Muslims would say, no, he's wrong, but I'm right. Am I not? If you know the faith, yep, hey. <laughs> so I want to stop talking now and just say that um, anything that can be fixed can be fixed. Cynicism is lame. <laughs> I, never saw, I never saw none. It's not sophisticated to not care or to say that all is lost and no good can happen. And that our world is counting on you to make it better than it is. So let's talk a little bit, you guys. Let's take the time to have you.